Jesus Christ. All right. Oh, let me turn the light on. What up, everybody? I'm Sal Kalani. This is Reggie Steele, the Sith Lord. And Steel. welcome. And welcome to spitballing. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> My buddy was like, uh, he's like, did you watch Ahsoka yet, dude? I'm like, slow down. I'm like, all right. Hey, dude, hold up, hold up. Talking to the talking to the the Star Wars fans that I know, the guys who are hardcore like you, they got all the trivia, they know all the names, they know everybody and who's who and what's what. Hey man, they're they're saying the sukkah is good. I'm just saying they said it's good. <laughs> I haven't even finished Mandalorian yet, though. So okay, I got I like, like halfway. I kind of got Star Wars out, bro. What? There's just how so many years did it take? Uh, Forty yeah. years. And, Andor did it. Andor was the final. Andrew yeah. finally pushed you over the edge after like, 35 uh, years uh, of Star uh, Wars. And then, so, yeah, I'll eventually watch, but whatever. Whatever. I mean, there's too much to watch now, man. There's, there's, a, lot kind of, in. there's a lot going on, man. Hey, everyone who's watching, Sal likes my hoodie. Man, um, he's got a thin hoodie. He can't help but look at himself in it now that I complimented him. I should have never said anything. <laughs> it's a It's a thin hoodie, but... But this is going to be an advertisement for the for the brand. Uh, just for the record, we don't have any sponsors yet. But maybe this could be the beginning. <laughs> so this hoodie is, it's a t-shirt hoodie with the hoodie attached. No zipper, as you can see. No pockets on the hoodie. So it's actually- Oh, I don't like that. I want, I need the kangaroo pocket. Yeah, no pockets on the hoodie. Um, but this is a, a brand called Vince, V-I-N-C-E. Uh, for those out there in the know, they know that's that's a fairly designer brand. It's nice. It's one of those in between brands. It's not like super high grade, but it's not the bottom of the barrel. It's like right there, right above middle. Right. It's really nice. And uh, I got mine at Nordstrom Rack. They yeah, regularly run it's good find. Yeah, they run. They regularly run for about three digits, um, with a one at the beginning. Uh, but I got mine for two digits. So we'll just I uh, I just there's another thing I was just looking at, very similar to that, like a brand above. Uh, you know, uh, Sergio Tacchini. No, nah, I don't know that Sergio Tacchini. I never heard of that shit. <laughs> this is Italian, and they do like tracksuits and velour and shit. And that <laughs> dude, there's this velour fucking hoodie and pants, and I was like, "Ooh, I might want to get some of that, dude." I don't think there's anything more Italian than velour <laughs> sweats tracksuits. Sweats. But this one, suits. this one, I wanted the hoodie one, so I was like, "There's a hoodie like that," but then. But a whole set, but we'll see. Does it? Does, it's got to have the stripes down the side. It's got to have at least two stripes down the side. This one, I don't know. There's many options. The one okay. I like is just black. I think I might go with. I don't know. We'll see. I might not need it. Oh, but, I mean, yeah, what I else can a... you wear? If it's just walking around once in a while to the airport, like what else yeah. would you really rock that? Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I I used to have. Now, look, <clears throat> as a guy who wore Sean John back in the day, you knew me at that time. I had a couple of velour Sean John track suits, sweat suits, whatever you want. Track suits, we'll go track suits. And uh, and I'll admit, they were comfortable. They were nice. They kind of hit the spot, right? Because I throw my T-shirt on with my velour top and my velour pants and hands in the pocket with the NY hat and little chain, right? It was a whole look that was like early 2000s, right? Like 2007, 8, 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can rock the velour. <laughs> why not so what i mean uh it didn't it didn't like track any like fur and shit does it like no does it get all messy or it's not too warm no, no not even my you just well, you I, got sick of doing legit. it i just it's like you know how you outgrow styles man not, right? not me still would wear dressing the way i did <laughs> in high school exactly <laughs> outgrow styles what are you talking about i wore this in high school it's still yeah yeah <laughs> because this shit's back now this shit it was so off dude i've been selling like i i sold a t-shirt i sold a couple old rock shirts i had that, that i got back in the 90s and yeah. i just didn't want them and that's so hot right now i guess and i, I sold really okay i sold one for like 168 bucks wow that's impressive that's pretty <laughs> I good know, dude people will buy this shit hey, look dog. i think that it's okay to dress like you did in high school if you're still in High school, uh, right? uh, like, uh, like even now high school kids today can dress like we dress in high school because they're still in high school and it's all vintage right and it's come back around but that's their wardrobe like i can't i gotta i gotta mature bro i'm well, i can't wear a flannel i used to wear a flannel in high school I can't wear flannels now uh 
I'm not saying you can't wear it. Or hoodies, actually... it's the same shit. No, not the same shit, because this is a different type of hoodie. Ah, this is the Vince. <laughs> this is a Vince. Oh, the other brand that I'm a, a big fan of, too, is the uh, Viore. Viore. Oh, I've heard of that. How do you spell that? Uh, what is it? Uh, v U. V U R V U R shit I can't hold up I'll look it up right now I don't want to Viore um Viore it sounds Italian dude oh that's a th- it's a theory Viore yeah you got to type it dude yeah. hey uh so speaking of Viore. style yeah. your uh, shoes are gonna be coming in I think on Wednesday Wednesday yeah oh, you already know nice yeah um. Yeah, they come in on Wednesday. I'm excited. Nice. I was rocking them last night in Beverly Hills. That's okay. where I want to be. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to <laughs> Beverly Hills. All right. Viori. V-U-O-R-I. There you go. Viori Clothing. That's another. That's a really nice brand. I could get Viore, a cool a cool hoodie off of that. Uh, I think you go with the vents for the hoodie. Viori um, has... I think you probably get a good hitty there too, though. Both of both of those brands are once again they can be a little pricey, but they're high quality, right? So it's you're gonna pay a little bit more, but you're gonna you're gonna feel good, right? Like the material feels good. It's gonna it's gonna hang well on your body. Uh, it's gonna last a while, right? Mm-hmm. So so don't be afraid to spend a couple dollars. You can also look for them at at Nordstrom Rack if you don't want to go to Nordstrom. All right, hey, here's where I was last night, Reg. Let me show you this pretty, uh, beautiful theater. Beverly Hills. Oh, that's right, because you were with Tim Meadows last night. Yeah, that's so right. this is Texas a theater. To... Oh, look at Beverly that. Beverly Hills. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. Uh, and then the classic um, view, the theater with. Look at my name up on the thing. Look at uh, that. Maximum occupancy. Yeah, I took too. a shot with, uh, with my nephew. That's my nephew. He was so stoked. And I was like, how's my nephew who's 13 no Tim Meadows? And uh, he's a big fan of Bob's Burgers. So he knows him from that. And I was like, oh. that's funny. And I was like, man, Tim's multi-generational. Look at that. And then the whole family. We found cheap slices in the middle of Beverly Hills. And there was like all these fancy restaurants. And there was a wait and all these like models of people dressed up and like Hundred, you know, entrees for forty, fifty, sixty dollars, right? And then we found these cheap slices for uh six bucks and pay. <laughs> hey, was that your cousin Nick in there? I think his name. No, no, Joey. Joey, that's right. Yeah, I, I think my, so Nikki that's his Joey. kid. Joey's a, his uh, yeah, and his kid is Rossi. So uh, yeah, and I didn't know he was gonna bring his kid, and then I'm just doing my thing, and then afterwards, his, his kid comes out of the theater. I'm like, what? Do they let you in? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, they didn't care. And uh well, he's with his parents, right? So yeah, he's with his dad. So, but yeah, it was funny, man. Wait, do you, like, do you don't do anything too risque, do you? No, but I you know I get a little dirty. But uh he loved Are it. You... He was like, he's like, Man, Uncle Sal, you're so confident on that stage, it's so cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah, he was really uh stoked. And he's like, That's the most and then he met Tim. He's like, That's the most famous person I met. He's like, oh, I love Bob's Burgers. I was like, Bob's Burgers. I forgot he was in that. <laughs> so he's a he's a he was a voice of one of the characters. Yeah, he's he a had voice like a guest in, spot. I think he's a once in a while they'll have him come back. I don't know okay. if it's, it's I think it's a student. I don't know what it is. He's like a semi regular guest or semi regular character. Yeah. Okay. So okay. so yeah, that was we the very two extremes, bro. I went from Fort Worth, Texas last Friday to Beverly Hills this Friday, and um. Yeah, so here's a clip from Fort Worth. You Living probably... the dreams. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, dreams. it's de- I could definitely, you know, it gets tiring at times. I'll admit that. All right, oh, yeah. here we those go. Are the, those are the kicks right there. Yeah, those are the kicks on Texas. So I first I debuted them in Texas. So Look at this. how are you standing right now? What oh, is I like going to move. On that stand. All right, can you hear it? No, you can't. I cannot hear it. Hold. No. Stop the share. Stop the share. I hate this fucking technology. <laughs> Too bad we don't have anybody to. Uh... Oh, that's all I have to do. Yeah, we I don't have to... a sound engineer, right? Like we don't have. We ain't got shit, Reg. We don't have the the. Tech we should person. put our Venmo up. All right, here we go. Ready? Okay. Oh, I know I'm in Texas. That's why I'm enjoying doing it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm good. Go back to California. Oh shit, really? They're still, they're still so mad. 
I'm so mad about it. It's like, did I come in? You know how many years I saw the Browns lose, and I never went, Browns won, you guys, Browns won, you're wrong, you're wrong. The stats are wrong, the stats, let me talk to the commissioner, he's wrong. Again, though, oh, God, oh, yeah. that's the best way to end any uh, riff. Yeah, um, yeah, that man. A... So some Trumpers out in Texas. Hey, man, I gotta admit, I felt, <laughs> I felt a little uncomfortable with that. Go back to Texas. I feel like, like California. Said, go back to I mean, California. Go back to California. That makes me feel a little uncomfortable because I'm sure that's that's mm. been before he even said California. I'm sure he said go back to Mexico. Oh yeah, but go, go back, back to, to Africa. That's all that is. All right. Yeah. Go back to Israel. Go yeah. back to wherever you came from. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, yeah. yeah. But what was cool is how I got the whole crowd to turn on them. And then after that, many people came up to me and was like, thank you so much for doing that. You shut down those Trumpers right in front of us. Yeah. And all they buy and shit and stuff. So I was like, you forget there's cool people everywhere. And, yes. you know, you got to stand up because they're not going to be as loud as us. You know what I mean? So when we have the opportunity, do it because, these loud, Absolutely. ignorant people are fucking loud as fuck. Well, so you, know, you got to stand up to it. What do I always say? You know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? Yeah. Right? So it's like they 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 scream the loudest, so they get all the attention. Right. But I think you make a good point that it's like, yo, you know, there's, there's there are good people everywhere. There are people who push back against this nonsense, <clears throat> right? And so right. sometimes we forget that because the people who <clears throat> get highlighted the most are the ones who are, um, you know, the loudest and the wickedest and the, you know, the dumbest and whatever. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a uh, woman. You're in Texas, so what, motherfucker? I'm in America. That's called freedom of speech. <laughs> <laughs> yes, America trumps Texas. Yeah, that, you know, right? Buffoons, man. So, you're in, hey, you're in Texas now. Yeah, and even people were like, uh, make, make, you know, we'll make sure y'all get home safe and shit. And you know, and I'm like, get the, what the fuck? Hold on, what did you say at the beginning? You said make America green again. Yeah, so that was the end of this whole bit where I go off on Trump, and okay. um, and so that was just the closer, and then that's what they could, you know, that's where it set them off. <laughs> but it is no! funny because it's so weird, man. It's so weird, like because some places. You'll do it, and you'll definitely feel the tightening yes. a little. You know what yeah. I mean? And um, and uh, but that's the thing. Like I don't just sit there and trash. I say Trump's name once in the whole time, and it's when I just say, uh, you know, and I say Trump supporters, so I'm making fun of them. But uh, but that's it. Like I don't even get that. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. even go that hard. But they're so fucking triggered and sensitive, and they're fucking such losers, and. Yeah, man, it's it's a weird, it's weird, it's weird. And now, Sal's so changing the world, changing people's mind. One comedy club. I at hope. Time. But then, well, now we got this fucking these idiots. Uh, the no, the no label party. You hear about these guys? No, the no label party. What yeah, the hell? dude, you're not hip to the no label party. They're gonna fuck us into in next year. No, the no boy. label party is run by you know that the who is the math guy, the the smart guy, the Asian dude, Yang. Who ran for? Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I remember him. Some year, couple years, few years. We ago. should look up his yeah. name. That's probably uh, whatever his fuck, yeah. whatever. Okay. Bo and Yang played him well on uh, SNL. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But whatever his, uh, he starts to get this fucking party, the no label party, right? Where they're like okay. either side. All you're doing is taking people oh, from taking the Democratic away. side from Biden. And, yeah. and they already got like 15,000 people signed up in Arizona, a state that Biden only won by 10,000 votes. So it's already drama, bro. Dude, we are. I'm we over are, the shit. No, they dude, said no third parties ever won one electoral. One. <laughs> dude, we, we live in a, in a divide and conquer society and world. And we're doing it to ourselves. Right. You understand? Like the other side is like, no, we are absolutely going to follow this dude. Rain well, now, now that's bad. a problem, too, because those little minority now in the, the House, the Republicans, who are all Trumpies, they won't pass the fucking budget or whatever. So now we're going to have a government shutdown because of these assholes. And I love how like Republicans are so about, well, I love the military, uh, but we're going to stop paying the military because we don't want to approve the government funding. We love the police, but we're not. We're going to stop paying the police because of this little government. It's like. 
You're such hypocrites. They're gonna yeah, shut down you... the government. Police and military won't get paid. Yeah, and, and you know so why? Stupid. You know why? It's all because there's a democratic president. Right. So, right. Because what's gonna happen is they're gonna do this. They do this. They shut down the government and they say people didn't get paid. People lost their jobs or whatever the case may be. And they go, and this was all under the Biden administration. Right. Right. So the details get lost. Only thing history is going to history is going to show that what they can use is that, oh, yeah, when there's a Democratic president, we can't get things done. Look, the government shut down and the police didn't get paid and the fire department didn't get paid and everybody. And it's like, yeah, but you're the one who held the checks. Yeah, you're the ones doing it. You shit. actively held the checks back. But you want to say it was his fault when you're holding the money, bro. Yeah, it's right? a gay, it's gangster as fuck, man. It's, it's a terrible. Gangsters. It's That's terrible. terrible. Those are the links that they're willing to go. They're like, yeah. They're like, look, I'll shoot myself in the foot and say you did it. Right? Right, That's right. What, yeah. It's like, look what you did. It's like, yo, you pulled the trigger. But it was under your watch. Yeah. It was under your watch. And so now I maim for life because you, right? So there was, I think Matt Gates or one of them was like, oh, if the voting rights bill gets passed that the Democrats want, no Republican will ever hold uh, presidency again. And it's like, you know, I, because they, all, why? Because they're gonna remove cheating. Yeah, yeah, they're cheating. gonna take cheating out of uh, elections. It's like, what the fuck, dude? There's exactly. such garbage. I dude, can't stand it. They, that's literally admitting. Yeah, that's literally admitting. If you wait, wait. If you change the rules where people can't cheat, then we <laughs> don't have a chance. <laughs> right? Like we, we can't win if we can't cheat. Exactly. Exactly. Think about it. You know, the last, you know, when Bush and Trump won, neither of them got the popular vote. So yeah. it's just like, ugh. ugh. Um, are you ugh. watching are you watching Winning Time by chance? So I haven't watched the second season. I watched the first season. Everybody's out about it. I think the, they're getting a little uh their their fandom is is making it because I thought the first season was cool, but I always felt each episode was like 15 minutes too long. <laughs> oh there God. wasn't much action. It wasn't much happening. There's a lot of uh, uh but the second season is supposedly way better, huh? Because now they're going to the I mean, final. it's over now. The second season's done. And was it good? It. Oh, yeah, they canceled it. it. That's right. And they canceled yes, it. Because all, all this basketball fans and Laker fans it watch sucks, it. It sucks, dude. It sucks because the show is good, right? Like the show, the show was actually good. It was it's the rise of the Laker dynasty, but it's not. It's not just about the games. It's right. not just about the games, but it's about the personalities behind the game. So it's like, yeah, I know every game, everybody wants to see Magic and Larry Bird go against each other, but Jerry Buss was doing a thing. Jenny Buss was becoming a person. Yeah, Jerry right? Buss is cool. Jerry Buss is cool, but Jenny, per Jenny Buss is becoming a person. Uh, Magic Johnson is figuring out his life outside of basketball. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is learning, is figuring out yeah. his life. Well, they covered it. He got the first two years. What else do they Dude, need? But it's because it's over <laughs> now. But the point I was going to make is, is that in season two, I guess this would be a spoiler, but we're talking about not being able to win without cheating, right? Or being able to not being able to play the game fairly in a certain way. I'm not going to give it away, but in season two, you see that there are some things that happen in the you know it's funny 84 finals where you go oh that's that's fucked up. it's funny because i just was flipping through the channels and there was adrian brody giving a speech after a game and it was in the finals so i kind of almost spoiled but he he was so good in it in the speech he was given and saying how they know they can't beat us so they have to try this other way so we're not playing like ourselves and that's the only way but he was so good at it that I was like, okay, I'll have to give the second season a try. <laughs> Dude, this is the thing. And I, I look, it's a good show. And I we live, oh my God, it bothers me so much. So we live in this world now where, like Sal just said, there wasn't enough action. It wasn't enough action. It's like, does every scene have to be action packed? What about story development? What about character? There's development? a lot of it in that series. Yeah, because you got a lot of moving parts and you got a lot of complex characters, right? Like, I know we, everybody just wants the highlights of everyone's life, but sometimes those little things lead to big things, right? Like uh -huh. a drip, a drip can fill up an ocean one day, but it may take time, but it's like, yo, we'll get there, right? Mm -hmm. So, dude, it bugs me so much. I'm saying, I see it in shows, like the fact that they canceled Lovecraft Country, which is a, a great show. It was phenomenal. The fact that they just canceled this uh, late, you know, winning time, which is really good. I thought I, en I, I enjoyed it tremendously. It's this lack of patience. For things to develop it's the same thing in football 
with quarterbacks. It's like they go through quarterbacks so much that it, you would think that they're like just a plethora of great quarterbacks. But the reality of it is there isn't. There's only like three guys that are actually really good, like four guys that are really good. And then everyone else is somewhat mediocre or just okay. And that's right. only because they never get a chance to fully develop and grow. No right. one has patience. You think Danny Man uh, not Danny Manning, uh Peyton Manning and Eli Manning and Tom Brady and Philip Rivers and Drew Brees and you know Donovan McNabb or even Steve McNair, and you go back to Warren Moon or Steve Young or Joe Montana and Joe Namath. You think all these guys got pulled after like one or two years of having or one or two seasons of having a subpar season or okay season? No, they were able to play through that stuff and learn and be able to grow. Now it's like, yo, every year they want you to like get excited about some new unproven quarterback or a guy who had two good games yeah, uh, because he came in. And it's like, yo, it's such bullshit. It's like, yo, everybody slow the fuck down. Be patient. We'll get there, right? It's like, it's it's the journey of a thousand miles, man. It, it starts with the first step. You're not going to cover the whole thousand miles in a day. Like, yo, kick back, relax, and keep moving. <laughs> Whatever. We live in this instant gratification society. Everyone wants everything right now. Or they want everything yesterday. Right. 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 So um sucks. So I got a message from uh somebody uh on the podcast asking us to talk about something. Oh boy. So just for the crowd, for the audience to know, uh I was not prepared for whatever's about to happen. Uh, you know, but I mean, we should have known. It's got to come up. They were asking about how we feel about Hassan Minhaj and his, uh, the New Yorker article. And uh, I was wondering if we were going to address that. I mean, we both uh, knew this gentleman. <laughs> uh, what's up with you? You you guys were way, way closer than uh, I was with him. And you kind of, you're not, well, you haven't talked to him much though, huh? Uh, you know what, man? I'm just gonna be honest with you. Uh, there was a point where I would reach out to to Hassan, and uh, you know, just the the response became smaller and less frequent, right? right, right like the responses right. were shorter and less frequent. Um, and I was like, okay, I, you know, I'm really yeah. cool. I was at the dude's wedding. You know what I mean? Like, I oh, you were at his wedding. Oh, I was wow. at his wedding, right? So, you know, obviously, I, something happened. And then he would come to town, right? He would come to town. This is when I was doing stand-up, and he wouldn't. He he'd invite everybody else to be a part of the show, <laughs> but you, but, but me. But it's fine. It's, it is what it is. I remember Reggie used to do did these videos with him. It was a couple funny sketch videos, and that shit all got scrubbed once he got famous. <laughs> well, they were all based on my material too. Right? <laughs> oh, okay. They were all based on on jokes that I had written material. Um, yeah. So once he got famous, then he he scrubbed those and. Uh, Unfortunately, I never had copies of him. I tried to get copies, but that's that's neither here nor there. So every time um, he's coming to town, you haven't even seen him. Nope. No. Nope. Uh, I think he was just there this week too. Um. So, like, uh, if any people don't know, there's a big old article in the New Yorker where he had a special. He had his TV show, The Patriot Act, and then he also had his special, the the first one, Homecoming King. Oh, and, and then, then the King's Jester. King's Jester. And now and, he's he's preparing another special call off with his head. So it's got a king theme, which is interesting. The king theme, mm. right? Homecoming king, court's just king's gesture, and now off with his head. And now oh, he's that's funny. Yeah, and he's he's um he's experiencing some backlash from some of the content that he did on stage. And let's just I'm just gonna put it out there. So in this New Yorker article, basically what I think happened, I talked to Greg Edwards about this. What we think happened is, um, I don't even know if I should have said his name, so maybe you blocked that up. But um, we were thinking, you know, we were thinking that he was he was he was one of the guys that was up for the Daily Show job, and we, me and some other guys, were thinking that he may have been the front runner, and maybe it leaked, it leaked that he was potentially going to get the job. And some reporter said, "Okay, well, let's just let's go look into Hassan Minhaj," and and upon looking and investigating looking at his specials and trying to trying to confirm some of the stories that he told on stage, this particular reporter was having a difficult time finding the truth, right? Like, like, okay, you said this story happened, but I can't find any record of this story and I can't find anyone who can corroborate this story. So he went and talked to him 
and I give him props for it. It's like, yo, look, man, I tried to do a thing. I couldn't do it. So I'm gonna come talk to you. Is this true or is this not true? And in that article, in this New Yorker article, Hassan basically said, well, some elements of it are true, but some stories are completely fabricated, like completely not true at all. But they, yeah. but they express my emotional truth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not exactly sure what that means. <laughs> um, I think part of the problem is too, is like, cause you know, he wants to say like, we all uh, exaggerate in comedy and yes, bullshit it, a little, but he's actually using real people and names and like historical events and trying to tie it together. And then that's where the problem lies. And that's where the problem is. Like, look, as a comedian, we all embellish. Now look, personally, I don't lie on stage. There's never been a time that I've ever lied on stage. Whatever story I told was absolutely true, be it my story or someone else's stories. And if it was someone else's stories, then I established that that was not necessarily mine, that it was someone else. Oh, oh yo, this happened to a friend of mine. Or even sometimes if it actually happened to me, then I would say, I know a person, right? Because I, maybe I don't want to be that vulnerable, but, I would, but the story itself would be true. Now, who it happened to exactly may not be true, you know, true in the sense that I'm saying it's someone else when it's actually me. Or if it is someone else's story, then I would say it's someone else's story. But I've never taken someone else's story and told it as my own story personally. Right, right. right. And and the way that he was presenting these, these um, stories, he presented them with an element of truth. But you got to mm -hmm. also think about his specials. His specials are not pure stand-up comedy specials. His specials right. have more of a, a one-man show feel with comedy interjected right he's a storyteller right. who's doing a thing and so there's this element of oh he's telling us his story and then some of the stories that were fabricated or exaggerated that he would say right exaggerated or embellished i think that he could have done it differently one for example is the story that he told on stage about receiving an envelope with white powder in it and he opened the envelope and it fell on his daughter and they had to rush her to the heart hospital for fear of it being anthrax and then his wife is you know she's up in arms and she's upset and if you put my child in danger again or my children in danger again then i'm leaving you right he presented that story like it actually happened but he wants to say his emotional truth i think he could have easily said look man i'm being targeted i i received an envelope with white powder in it which actually happened right, right? which actually happened but then he could say yo that's crazy what if i had opened that envelope and my daughter was around and they got on her we would have to rush her to the hospital my wife would be up in arms she would probably leave me over some shit like this right, right, right. but this is what i'm experiencing that's the emotion now that is an emotional truth right of like what it could have been you can't say what it you can't say what it was and have it not be that that's not true right those hey. Here's a those quote. Are things, yeah, those are the things that I had a problem with. And then the last quote he had in the article, I really had some pushback against that too. Well, here's something where you were just referencing this this uh reporter for I don't know what this is, NBC News and fucking somewhere. But uh they were saying how um uh now I just lost it. Oh, he, the the quote is he seems the professor says he seems to think it's creative storytelling. That's how he seems to present it, but he also wants to be known as someone who speaks on social justice issues, who is on the side of the oppressed. But he's not just trying to entertain people, he wants to do social justice issues, working up people's sense of moral outrage and not giving them an inkling that they are not based on fact. And that's and okay, so that was the other thing I was gonna say is based on the platform that he's chosen to take in and the stance that he's chosen to take in and the, the topics that he's chosen to, to address, he presents himself as the guy who's holding other people accountable, right. Mm -hmm. For their lies or their, or what, what do we call them now? Um, uh, fake news, right. False truth. So whatever you want to call Somebody it. even said compared what he does to alternative facts alternative facts right so we're if you're presenting yourself as that then there's that the idea of that belief that oh here's someone that we can trust the thing about john stewart and about trevor noah is that both of those guys were very sincere and very genuine and facts were absolutely imperative to the story now if they wanted to make fun of the person and and make fun of their you know them bending the facts they always brought it back to what actually it was 
right? Right. And we, and we believed them. That was the thing that made them so great is that <clears> we <throat> believed them and we trusted that what they were giving us was the truth. This right. article in him saying that what he said and, and, and owning up and saying that, yeah, I, okay, yeah, I made those stories up, but they're an emotional truth. But we don't know that as an audience. Right. We're right. thinking that you're telling us something that actually happened. I mean, right. even in the article, and I'm not saying anything that's not out there for public knowledge, but even in the article, there was a point where in his show, he posted tweets of, you know, um, uh, there were supposed to be tweets that were uh, directed like, at him that were negative tweets or threatening tweets that were later discovered to be completely fabricated, not real. You yeah, know how much effort it takes to come up with a person and a and a profile and an at name to come up with a thing and make the make it. They bro. make that's that's lying, bro. That's not an emotional truth. That's a lie. Right. Right. There is, it, is the truth. This article. Yeah. This article's title is like why his fabrications could invalidate real accounts of racism and in Islamophobia. Which kind of makes sense if someone could experience real shit and then they could be like, well, he's lying. So these guys are all liars. You know what I mean? They, and that's kind of what they're suggested. They do. And people do that all the time. People are always looking for ways to invalidate right. other people's experiences, especially right. black people, people, or people of color or brown people. They, they're always looking for ways to prove that what you're saying isn't true. And they use it. They'll do it in a heartbeat with some shit like, um, you know, you say, man, as a black dude, it's hard to walk in society because I feel like people, people, you know, they, they treat you differently. Right. Right. And then there's always that person like, well, hey, I got a black friend, Gary, and he's fine. He never experiences that. Right. right, because right. They, they look at us as a monolithic society. So if one black person is having an experience that's counter to somebody else's experience, then they go, well, no, it's not true because I know this guy and it's not like that for him. So it can't be true. So right. now in this situation with him, I can totally see that being the case. That's like my buddy was texting me and he goes, well, you know, I never faxed up, uh, uh, a picture of my dick to the office or whatever so what now people are going to fact check me i'm like there's a difference though people know you're joking on stage when you say it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> nobody believe in that <laughs> exactly look i i've been saying this all week because i've been talking about this um there's one thing there's one way for me to say yo man i got jumped by 80 dudes one time right i could say that and you go wait what i can present that as like i got jumped by 80 dudes if I want to be a, if I want to make it a joke, right? Or I can say, yo, I got jumped by 80 dudes. Well, I mean, it was really just one dude, but it felt like 80 dudes because he was kicking my ass, right? right like right, right. I got, I got jumped by 80 dudes and got my ass kicked, right? That sounds like I'm presenting it as a fact, but I want to make it a joke and an embellishment. I got jumped by 80 dudes. Well, it was really, and I got my ass kicked. Well, it was it was really one dude, but it felt like 80 dudes, right? Because that's how he was kicking my butt. There's a difference in how you present. I think everything that he did, he could have, I think he could have prefaced it a little better where it came across as this is a potentially what could have happened, right? Uh, or what if this had happened, right? Or look at these, even if, and I don't even know how you can, I don't know how you finagle the tweets. It's like, maybe you juxtapose it to, uh, you know, real tweets versus what it could have been, right? Like this guy, these people tweeted this and these are real tweets, but we live in a world now that I can easily see somebody tweeting this. And then you make those super extreme, right? right? Of what it could be. And you go, well, I go, we're not here yet, but the way things are going, I'm sure I'm going to get these tweets next week, Right. And then you just keep going and they get so, so crazy that it's like, okay, now it's obviously a joke. But instead of juxtaposing it against something that's real, you take the neck, the fake thing, and you put that in place of what's real. Now that is a fabrication. And that's an emotional truth that we are not experiencing because that's not the truth of what it was. We have an emotional experience about a thing and a, about a person that we feel strongly about or we're trusting in some way that gave us something that makes us feel like, Oh my goodness, that make us sympathize for this person to later find out that what it was is not true. It's right. old girl who got kidnapped on the freeway in, right. in Alabama, <laughs> right? The whole world is like, oh my goodness, this woman. And they used a toddler to, to lure her in and she was stopping to save the kid and they took her. Who is so nefarious that they would use a child to, a, to abduct a woman? Oh my God, where are we headed to, in society? And then however many days later, she comes walking out the woods 
What happened? Where's the kid? We got no record of a child being. What? Well, I. Yeah, it was. It was it, my emotional truth. It was uh, my emotional truth. Like, yeah. Some of you read, I mean, it's, I read this New Yorker. And some of his employees for the Patriot Act were shitting on him. They said how uh, Minhaj just assembled people around him to make him appear different and much smarter and more thoughtful. But those people, the smart and hardworking people, were treated poorly for bringing the perspective that he is celebrated for. <laughs> Damn. Damn. That, that part was damaging, too, especially the part about him pushing back against fact-checking. Yeah, yeah, he's a fact-checking. Uh, the Patriot Act was extremely rig rigorous, Minhaj said. A uh, team of news producers fact-checked every line, every draft for eight to ten times before I said anything on camera. But they say the researchers were sent out of the writer's room. It was standard okay, practice during rewrites. Well, no, hold though. You got to you can't. You got to put in the part where um, the re the fact-checkers were pushing back against some of the jokes because the facts were being bent. Right. And so he was saying that the fact checker fact checkers were hindering the funny in the material. Right. And so eventually the fact checkers or the researchers were sent out of the room. Right. And not allowed to be a part of that process. Right. Because if you read the read the very last line of that article, his quote at the very last line, and this is the problem that I have a I have a problem with this. Oh, he says, uh, when it came to his stage shows, he told me the emotional truth is first, the factual truth is secondary. Mm. The emotional truth is first and the factual truth is secondary. We can't have the facts and the emotions, right? So you want to create a you want to create a, a feeling that's not based on truth. Mm. Right. right, right. Right. And that's and that's his own words. The emotional truth comes first and this, you know, factual truth. It's, it is interesting because the stuff's been out a while. And then, but now we, you're right. I think because of the show, because another one, they're going about the homecoming King that this, uh, he's talking about how he got turned down for the prom or whatever. Oh yeah. And a and girl came. Woman. Yeah. And they yeah. said that was, she, she said she did turn him down who was then a close friend in person days before right. the dance. He yes. acknowledged that this was correct, but he said that the two of them had long carried different understandings of her rejection. And, you know, he's saying he's a brown kid in Davis, California. But then she said, this is crazy, that her and her family faced online threats and doxing for years because Minaj had insufficiently disguised her identity and the fact that she was now engaged to an Indian-American man. <laughs> Which is funny. Holy cow. You, oh, yeah. you oh dude, that's even <laughs> that's even more. You you present this person as being anti-brown and now she's engaged to a brown man, right? <laughs> um, I thought the problem with that one, the thing that kind of bugged me about that one was that she said she gave him sufficient um notice before the prom, right? Um, that they weren't that she she wasn't going with him. Um, but he presents that particular story as he showed up to her house, prepared to go to see another guy there putting a corsage on her, right? Oh, so yeah, it yeah. creates this it creates this image in people's minds of this kid who's just imagine, let's tell the backstory. He's at home. He's running a tuxedo. They've coordinated colors. He's got a rental car. Or he's borrowed somebody else's nice car to go to this place to pick up this girl. He's happy, right? Because this is what happens in the mind. He's happy. He's excited. He's looking forward to this experience. He pulls up to the house. She's on the porch with another guy and his her her family and taking pictures. And now he's completely been rejected and pushed aside and discarded without even notice. Right. Like that creates an emotion. Even me telling that story right now, I feel bad for this kid who went through all the prep, who put on his little cologne to try to look good and right. in the mirror, who's primping and doing the whole thing, drives over, gets a ride over, gets out of the car, walks up to the house. It's like a scene from a movie only to have the girl standing on the porch with another guy and her family approving of him and not the per and not, you know, approving of that guy and not him. That creates an emotional feeling that I just created in this instant that he prop that he created that wasn't true. Right. And none of that emotion is laughter it's uh yeah it's more like oh a pain yeah, it's, feel it's for a the pain person. it's like oh you feel for this person who's experienced something so heinous for right. a young person everyone knows how important prom is right, right? 
right? So you're you're tugging on the heartstrings of people who who went to prom and remember it, or the people who didn't go to prom who wanted to go to the prom, right? Because they didn't have anybody to go with. And so now here's a situation that you've created a, an image or a picture that didn't happen. And so those are the those are the issues that I have with this whole thing. Look, I think he's a very talented guy. There's no question about that. He's not where he is by mistake, right? Mm -hmm. He has a way of doing things. He has his own style, his own approach. And a lot of that has been based on taking this high moral ground of being the guy who's, you know, going to hold you to task, got it, who's going to push the envelope a little bit. You know, he's he's, you know, he's rubbed people the wrong way in a lot of situations with some of his questions and things of that nature. Um and how he's gone about things. But for the most part, we felt like it was coming from a real and true place. When you start questioning a person's motives, right? Or their, I don't know, their integrity in some degree or whatever the case may be. Um, I think it's hard. It's the same thing with reporters. As a reporter, if someone calls you a liar as a reporter, you lose credibility, right? People then do not want to hear... I thought one of the worst things, look, I'm not a huge KD fan. I think he's a phenomenal player, extremely talented. There's no question about that. He's a unicorn in a lot of ways. Um, but when he got upset with Stephen A. Smith, who's built his whole career on being a guy who was like, look, I'm a trusted source of info. I got trusted sources of information. I got people who are close to the to what's going on. And they're telling me that Kevin Durant is going to the blah, 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 blah. Right? Pretty good. Thank you. When you got the guy doing that and you got this other guy who sits on the podium and goes, Stephen A. Smith, I don't know who you talk to. You're lying. You're a liar. Yo, this whole guy's career, his whole life, his whole job, everything is based on the fact that he's telling the truth based on his sources. It's supposed to be factual and true. If you call that dude a liar when he's actually telling the truth, right now you're trying to destroy his career but you if that guy is telling the truth if that guy is outright lying then he's done right right he's done right. so i mean basically you think you got to think this is probably going to cost them the daily show job and I he mean, probably would have been the front runner and i kind of feel like we know the three guys but him Roy Wood Jr. and Michael Costa. I imagine those would be the top three, at least from the show, right. that they could be considering. But um, yeah, I think this would probably cost them the Daily Show job now. I mean, I I was talking to one comic. He was like, he was like, man, look, and this guy is in Hollywood, and he's like, look, man, because I said the same thing. I go, for you to sit in that seat and present yourself the way that previous hosts have, and what that show has been. Right. It's Based got, on, it's very about fact. It's very, yeah, very, very much about fact. Um, I think that he, I think this probably ruins his chance. Personally, that's what I thought. But this guy was like, look, man, it's a, it's Hollywood. It's about money. This will blow over as, as a, as a brown person, he brings in 1.6 billion people as far as viewers, right? 1.6 billion? Well, just the idea of being a brown person and being, I mean, and a Muslim, right? Right? Like, right. there's a demographic that he can tap in based on who he is, based on his religion, and based on where he's from, or where his, you know. But see, that's from. also the fine line about, you know, Muslim and brown, and if you're distorting facts, people are just gonna, like, it might hurt the group, you know I, what I mean? I mean, it could, but, you know, Comedy Central is like, well, they don't care who's watching. If they got eyes on the show, if they're getting one point you know, if they're getting 2 million views a week. We'll see, though. I mean, it doesn't mean guarantee now that, you know, he's going to get that now. Well, yeah, look, I personally, I think that this hurts his chances just based on what the show is based on. Right. right? That's more of it, too. Like, yeah, yeah. I can see if he, I'm not going to say this isn't damaging, like he can't ever do a movie or anything right. like, like that. No, recover. he right. could still do that. But for a show that's based mostly on fact, this is definitely not the, uh, you know, well, the zing the other, you want well the other question is this i mean going forward if you know that you know stories have been fabricated like look based on the first the first special homecoming king that dude won a peabody award right mm. for that for that show he got a lot of he got a lot of accolades and a lot of um positive press and a lot of uh opportunities based on how how well that special was received and so now 
they look back and they vet it and they go, well, these things that probably created some some emotional truth, right? Some emotional experience wasn't true. Yeah. Right. right. So did we award a guy for just coming up with the the best made up show ever? Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not the best made up show. Uh, that's, that's but right. Mean. For that year. But for that year, right? Did we just award a guy? who you know it wasn't who real. bullshitted us <laughs> exactly when all of it could have probably just been changed but it, but then if you change it then it, it won't have the have same, same effect it right. won't have the same effect so then you know it's look i think i don't know how you know he's in the, he's he's in the spotlight and he's very young he's still got a long life to live and a lot of you know a career ahead of him but I do think that this probably needs to be addressed in a certain way because next special, there are already people who are like, you know, can we can we trust anything that he says? Can we believe right. anything that he says? So right. next special, if he's coming out, he's talking about his family or whatever experiences were as a brown person in Hollywood and now in the industry and these experiences. Yeah, like people are already commenting on his Instagram and anything, you know, what's up yeah. with a New Yorker? <laughs> yeah, where it's like, yo, do we is it real right right like is this is this the truth or is this just an emotional truth right which i still don't know what the hell the emotional truth is <laughs> i don't i don't know what the emotional <laughs> truth is because and look and i i'm i'm not i got nothing against this dude personally right obviously i've known him for a long time in a certain way um we shared some some experiences and a, and a time this is just based on being a comedian and being a person who who's been on stage and who's talked to rooms full of people and understanding the power of my voice and the power of my stories and how they affect people and how they have affected people and how people have told me that they affected them. And for me to know personally that those stories have been absolutely true, right? Absolutely. Finding out that I was adopted in, in my twenties, right? Uh, finding out that my biological mom was my cousin or my cousin was my biological mom. My uncle was my grandfather like not knowing any of that stuff right and being able to share those stories which were absolutely true my mom and feeding people and whatever the case may be and welcoming people into our home yes i embellish some of the things yes i used to do a joke that my mom loved to feed people she my mom is known to feed, feed people today need medical attention right one day my buddy's eating she feeding he eating she feeding he eating next thing i know my buddy didn't fill out on the floor in cardiac arrest but my mom sprang into action she said baby baby you want some dessert, <laughs> right? That's it's presented as, you, right. That's a joke. You, you, right. You, you, and then like, you're not getting no hospital records. Was there a cardiac arrest of a day? Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But you're not. You're not. You know. You're also not like my body is sweat. He's dying. This could be the. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Now, okay. So then I tell that joke that way, right? Which is how I used to tell that joke. That's an old one. But if I, if I, uh. Now, if I wanted to go to the next level, then I could go, you know, and my mom is like, she, she sprang into action. She does this thing. And she's like, you want, baby, you want some dessert? Baby, you want some dessert, baby? Right. Um, and then take it to the next level of, you know, but now my mom, my buddy's down there sweating. He's struggling. I'm like, mom, what are you doing? Stop feeding him. Now that takes it to another, another level where it's like, oh, oh shit, this actually happened. This dude right. is on the floor and she's trying to give him dessert. And you, as a person involved, now have to really get involved in a way to to change. What, like, no, we need to call nine one one. Put the strawberry shortcake down. We need to get some help, right? I started menacing chest compressions, right? Like, you know, it turns out he just had some lodged in his throat. It it came up and everything was fine. But that's bullshit because that's not really what happened. Right, right, right. And the whole idea, the embellishment is: yes, my mom loved to feed people. Absolutely. That's 100% true. There's no one that knows me that went to my house would dispute that. Right. But the fact that she fed people till they need medical attention, that's an exaggeration, but that's obviously just saying, yeah, but people would eat so much that they, they felt sick or they were, you know, it was too much for them. Right. Right. Um, yeah, man. So I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, I wish the best. All right, well, there it is. We addressed it. It sounds like more like I addressed it. I kind of just went in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know more. All right, um, we're going to wrap up, Reg. I'm, I'm uh, in Kansas City this week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, at the, I, don't know, I think the Kansas City Comedy Club. Uh, okay. My man, Tim Meadows. And nice. uh, shout out to Tim Meadows. 
Shout yeah, out for he, Tim Meadows. He's got a movie coming out. Uh, watch the trailer. I just saw the trailer. It's fucking okay. dope. It's called Dream Scenario with okay. Nicolas Cage. And okay. it's trippy as fuck, bro. But it's supposedly getting a lot of um, accolades. Okay. And uh, yeah, we'll see. Oscar buzz even. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, for, for, for Nicolas Cage, he, he, he's pretty funny in the trailer. It's, okay. It looks good. It looks and, good. I'm excited. And Tim is part of Tim Tim's in it. He's in the trailer, too. He's got a couple right. of shots in the trailer. So, uh, yeah, I'm All looking right. forward to it. Okay, well, uh, anybody out there? He can't promote case, it, you know. He can't promote it because he's in the the strike is going on. So yes. it's our it's our job as non union members. <laughs> okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa! No, 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 no! I'm sorry. I'm in the union, bro. Oh well, oh. you can't talk about it. Just listen okay. to me, guys. Dream okay. scenario dropping in November. <laughs> uh, but I will say this: anyone who's listening, if you know someone <laughs> in Kansas City, send them out to go see Tim and Sally Boy. I'm trying to get uh, Travis Kelsey's a fan of the ladies man, and I'm hoping he comes out and bring his new squeeze uh, Taylor Swift to a show. That'd okay. be nice. <laughs> but yeah. he did uh, he did uh, some impressions of Tim on his podcast a few weeks ago. Okay, because him and his okay. brother got a podcast. It's like when you got actual guys who are playing in the NFL or playing in the sport, and they still podcast. It's like. What yeah. chance do we have? Oh, wait, Rich? wait, did you just say Travis Kelsey and uh, and his brother Tennis? Jason? No, no, Kelsey. But, oh, you said oh, Tay no, he 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 shot his shot with Taylor Swift. He's trying. Yeah. He's put. I think he's putting the rumor out there more, but she's not. Um, I was gonna say I hadn't heard. There's no, that. there's no proof, but there's rumors. And his mm. brother said something, and then Travis is like, "Hey, you know, I saw you rock at Arrowhead. Why don't you come see me rock at Arrowhead?" That's funny. That's <laughs> but, funny. But. Uh, yeah, we'll see. But okay. anyway, all right, that's it. Thanks for listening, everyone. There it is. You ask us, yes. we'll address it. Yes. We, we, we fear none. We and, fear none. Uh, <laughs> and hold on, let me just say this. Uh, I want to say I mean, shout out just to being Tim. Real. Yeah, I want to say shout out to Tim Meadows for, uh, you know, uh, taking my man Sal with him on the road, man. This is an opportunity. Every comic who's listening to this, yo, this is, this is one of the ways of, like, living the dream, right? Like, sometimes... <laughs> You know, it's, maybe it's hard for you to build it, but if someone else recognizes your talent and you you ha they feel like you have something to bring to the table, then they're like, yo, come along for the ride. Like, let's go do this. Because this is what it is. It's like city to city, uh, you know, town to town, stage to stage, getting the opportunity to tell your stories to different people and getting a feel for what the country is like, right? So um, so shout out to Tim. Big ups to my man, Sal. Go out and support yeah, him. Yeah, he's, uh, I was telling him too. And I was like, I was like, you know, because I'm like, you're not like other comics. It's like he's already so comfortable with himself. Where he, like, you know what I mean? Where I always feel like people, are, even guys that are made men now mm -hmm. who are doing huge theaters all over, when I'd work with them at times, it's like, you know, you got to get put in your place. You got to get zinged. You got to get a little, you know what I mean? There's always like trying to, I don't know, prove themselves or something. And there's none of that hey, with this dude. This dude's been a made man so long that it doesn't fucking phase him. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And so it's cool to have that, you know, relationship with him. Well, let's just throw it out there. Hey, man, all this shit is fleeting, right? If you're mm. hot today, you can be burning up today and freezing tomorrow. Right. Right. So a lot of guys, hey, man, they're like, look, yeah, I'm here doing the thing. But tomorrow I got to do another thing because this is done. It's always like what it's not what it's not what you're going to do for me. It's like, what have you done for me lately? Right. right, right. So so there's a lot of pressure to feel like you got to keep going. They got to keep pushing. They got to control every single thing that's happening around them until you get past that tipping point. When you get past the tipping point where the money is making money for you. Right. Whatever. Tim Meadows. Look, he's done movies. He's been on specials. He's done the whole thing. He has, he's in a situation where he's doing stuff now because he wants to, not because right, he really right, has to. Right, right, right. But the guy who's doing something because he has to, because he's got a mortgage payment, he's got a car note, he's got a kid in private school, and he's got, you know, whatever else he's got to take care of. Yes, that dude is on edge about everything all the time because he's got to take care of business. His brand is important. Who's around him is important. Everything that, all the little meticulous details need to be in place because if he falls off, there's another dude that's at his heels right now waiting to right. take that spot. Who's like, yo, I'm available that theater today. 
I can do it. <laughs> no, I just had a special. I just did a show. I just did a movie. I just did a sitcom. I just did a. a I think it's thing. it's comics too, like yeah. you know, comics too. Where I'm kind of glad like he didn't start as a stand up, so he doesn't have as much of that. <laughs> right. He was an improv guy. He was a sketch guy. Yeah. Right. So yeah. he don't have the same the same baggage that come along with being. Yeah, there. definitely. There's baggage in stand up. All yeah. right, Raj, close us out, buddy. All right. Hey, folks, I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Sound I, I know Sound I did. So <laughs> uh, we love it. We're going to keep doing it. So with that being said, hey, if you like us, please like, subscribe, and share. Come on out and join us. And uh, yeah, let's keep making it happen. If you got some suggestions, something you want to hear us talk about, <laughs> bring it. In the comments. <laughs> Sal bring is it. reading the comments, so bring yeah. it. Oh, so with that being said, <laughs> that's Sal Kalani. And I'm Reggie Steele. And this is Spitballer. Peace.